Today, digital tyranny is one step closer. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, well known as Post, covering finance and property news. Do you remember the parable of the frog who slowly gets cooked to death in a pot as the temperature rises? Well, the same is true for Australians as civil liberties, such as the use of cash, are getting removed, even as the digital architecture for future control gets put in place. You can see parallels elsewhere around the world too, by the way, and it's aligned with the agenda of several high-profile non-elected bodies like the World Economic Forum of You Will Own Nothing and Be Happy Fame. Australia's Digital ID Bill 2023 was initially introduced to the Senate on November the 30th, 2023, and has since undergone a Senate inquiry and brief consultation period before this week being pushed through the Senate without debate. Despite assurances of voluntariness and promises to simplify citizens' lives, the Labour government has faced a backlash for the lack of scrutiny given to the bill. The legislation which established a national digital ID system received backing from the Australian Labour Party, the Greens, the Jackie Lambie Network, the independent David Vann. The bill's opposition came from senators from the Liberal Party, the United Australia Party, and the One Nation Party. One Nation Senator Pauline Hanson and United Australia Party Senator Ralph Babette both denounced the process, calling it a sad day for democracy, and criticised the government for pushing the legislation through without sufficient discussion. Liberal Senator Alex Antic, who opposed the bill, raised concerns about the bill's implications for privacy and civil liberties. Antic had collected 123,000 signatures opposing the bill and warned that the digital ID could lead to further encroachments on personal freedoms, such as linking to a central bank digital currency or a social credit system. The bill establishes a framework for a comprehensive digital identity system for Australians, consolidating personal information such as driving licences, Medicare cards, passports and Centrelink details. Currently, of course, Australians can use a digital ID for accessing government services, including MyGov, Centrelink, Medicare and the ATO. The legislation will expand this system to be used by state, territory governments and even the private sector. At this point, it's worth recalling that Justice Michael Kirby said of the Hawke government's Australia card proposal back in the 1980s, once an ID card system is established, the risk exists that the database will be enhanced and that more and more officials will seek access to it in the name of efficiency. A Senate Economics Legislation Committee inquiry into the Digital ID Bill was established late last year, and the government allowed just one month for submissions from the public, with the cut-off date being January the 19th. The committee's report was published recently, and unsurprisingly, the government-dominated panel recommended passing the bill. However, it did receive numerous submissions challenging the claims by the government that there was nothing to see here. A large number of submissions emphasised risks with centralising and digitalising personal information, such as insufficient protections for sensitive data, making it a very appetising target for hackers and Australia's enemies to launch cyber attacks. Submissions also warned of a future where access to services and goods could be contingent upon having a digital ID, raising ethical, privacy and societal implications. Labelling the digital ID as voluntary, by the way, can be misleading if it becomes an implicit requirement for essential services. Additionally, they also highlighted the insufficient safeguards against the likely misuse of personal biometric data, inappropriate safeguards against law enforcement access, and the potential for discrimination and surveillance. The New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, in particular, warned that the bill contains insufficient protections for the safe handling of sensitive data, as well as inadequate privacy protections and the possibility of digital ID being repurposed for surveillance or other unintended functions. In its submission, Digital Rights Watch focused on the lack of redress mechanisms for the digital ID bill for misuse of private data, and warned about inadequate data deletion practices and insufficient protections against data profiling. 
and in its submission to the committee, the Law Council of Australia raised concerns regarding inadequate protections surrounding privacy and the collection of personal information and biometric data. Family Voice Australia's submission to the committee highlighted the potential for function creep and involuntary implementation of the digital ID and involuntary implementation of digital ID. It noted the voluntary nature of digital ID could be undermined by exemptions and it warned about the broad accreditation scheme that allows private entities to issue the IDs. Senators Matt Canavan and Jared Rinnick pointed out in their minority report to the bill that there is no limitation on the agency's powers, but the vague and open-ended requirement for a mandatory requirement to be appropriate to do so. And in a dissenting report on the legislation, the Green senators on the committee expressed concerns that it will undermine the privacy and human rights of Australian citizens. The report pointed out that the Digital ID Bill could exclude those without digital literacy or access from essential services, as well as underlining that as it presently stands, the legislation fails to ensure that the digital ID system will be truly voluntary. Further dissenting report highlighted the potential for law enforcement excessive access to personal information and expressed fears about the use of biometrics and data profiling, suggesting that those practices might replicate existing biases and prejudices by public agencies and private corporations. United Australia Party Senator Ralph Babette said he doesn't trust the potential power digital ID will hold over Australian citizens. For those who don't know exactly what the digital ID is, it is essentially a digitalisation of your personal information. And it's worth remembering, by the way, that earlier National Australia Bank supported a push for a nationwide digital identity, claiming that an interoperable digital identity ecosystem is needed for Australians to connect their banking Connect ID, MyGov and state government apps, saying industry and community-led digital ID solutions will complete and extend the reach of existing digital government ID services. True, the bill was amended in the Senate to bring private sector identity service providers into the system within two years, and as a result, the Australian Senate passed the controversial Digital ID Bill 2023 with a 33 to 26 vote amid Vulcan concerns from some members over the lack of parliamentary debate. Several senators criticised the process, claiming the bill was expedited through Parliament and on social media, senators expressed their dissatisfaction. Finance and Government Services Minister Katie Gallagher moved amendments after a Senate committee inquiry and consultation indicating changes to the initial draft of the legislation. Actually, behind the scenes, there was some horse trading leading to the legislation being tweaked to gain enough Senate votes for approvals. As opposition parties, the Coalition of the Greens, had signalled they would not support the version of the bill which had been approved in the lower house earlier on. So rolling the system out incrementally would be a big government approach. According to the coalition, though assurance that private sector identity verification and service providers can be accredited within two years could knock down that hurdle. The amendments also added transparency requirements for law enforcement accessing the biometric data held by the ID systems and annual reports will be made to the Attorney General and passed on to Parliament. And language is also added to clarify that digital ID is voluntary in response to dissenting remarks in a Senate committee report, expressing concerns about requirements being added in the future. Businesses will be required to maintain a method of service access that does not rely on digital ID. Green spokesman David Shoebridge told the Australian Financial Review that genuine voluntariness and genuine consent are necessary to ensure that the bill does not create more a loophole than a protection. New rules will also require explicit consent from an individual who has deactivated their digital ID for it to be reactivated. Now, Senator Katie Gather's office confirmed that the bill includes amendments ensuring the digital ID system remains voluntary and that alternative verification methods would be accessible and fair for those opting out of the digital ID. In fact, Gallagher's media release said that Australia is a step closer to a national economy-wide digital ID system with legislation passed in the Senate. Digital ID is a secure, convenient and voluntary way 
to verify who you are online without having to repeatedly share your most sensitive documents, such as a passport, birth certificate, and driving license. More than 10.5 million Australians already have created an account with the federal government's digital ID system, MyGovID, to access more than 130 government services. And the digital ID bill 2023 is putting in place the legislative framework for the phased expansion of the Australian government's digital ID system to include state and territory government services and the private sector. The bill strengthens privacy and security safeguards and provides stronger regulation and governance of digital ID services. The Minister of Financial Services, Katie Gallagher, said data breaches such as Optus and Medibank have shown how important it is to keep Australians safe online. Digital ID makes it safer and easier for Australians to prove who they are online. Australians will be sharing less personal information, which is held by fewer organisations that are subject to stronger regulation, reducing the chance of identity theft online. And the coalition started this work while in government, but in classic style, didn't finish the job, she said. It's the Albanese government that is delivering a scheme which is safe, voluntary, and will protect Australians in an increasingly online world. The Digital ID Bill 2023 ensures that digital IDs are voluntary for individuals accessing government services. All government agencies must have an alternative way for individuals accessing government services. And for individuals in the community, digital ID can first provide a safe, secure, convenient, and reusable way to verify their ID online if they choose without repeatedly sharing copies of their ID documents with different services. Second, it'll make it easier for it to access government and business services at home or without having to travel to a shop front or to make a phone call to verify the ID, particularly benefiting groups such as regional and remote communities and people with a disability. And it will also enhance privacy and reduce collection of personal information by government and private services, reducing the impact of any data breaches that may occur and also reduce the need to remember many different usernames and passwords for different services by providing a reusable digital ID that can be used instead. Digital ID is just one of the ways the government is responding to the increase in third-party data breaches alongside the National Strategy on Identity Resilience, funding for the ACCC's National Anti-Scam Centre, the introduction of the Identity Verification Services Act 2023, continued reforms to the Privacy Act and the government's cyber security strategy 23 to 30. And she said the digital ID system has undergone extensive consultation over many years, including during the coalition's time in government, as well as a Senate Economics Legislation Committee inquiry last month, where the committee recommended the bill be passed. And so the government will introduce the bill back to the House of Representatives in the next sitting period. Given the fact the bill has passed in the Senate, the future landscape of digital identity in Australia is poised to change, Although, of course, the debate over its potential impact and democratic processes continue, hopefully the bill's future implications for privacy, security and civil liberties will be closely monitored by both supporters and critics alike. But actually, the Mandarin article by Julian Belaski has a different take, saying it's only taken two decades, but Australia is officially on the path to having a national government-regulated digital identity scheme to replace the hoarding of vast amounts of personal and financial sensitive data by banks, insurers, utilities and agencies, which are now being routinely hacked. The Albanese government finally secured the required support to enable legislation for the digital ID system in the Senate from the Coalition and the Greens on Wednesday after making concessions on safeguards and bank access to the new scheme, which will toughen privacy and speed of access to financial institutions and their clients. Banks, through the domestic payments network Australian Payments Plus, had wanted to modify the proposed digital ID legislation to circumvent the explicit prohibition of the use of racial markers, horrifying some stakeholders and policymakers. The bid got short shrift, although the government conceded to allowing banks and businesses expedited supposedly faster access to the phased rollout of the Australian Government Digital ID Systems, the AGDIS, down to two years from four. Still, it's clear the government intends to run the digital ID show. Banks are as keen as mustard to flip the current model of wholesale fees of around 70 cents per identity validation check flowing to the government under the Document Verification Service for gateway providers 
back to financial institutions so they can monetize the ID checks for regulated transactions. And by the way, Australia Post has been an early entrant into this market as a credential provider, but it's unclear whether the Labor government intends to head with the state-backed retail credential as banks try to offload access to cash and over-the-counter transactions on Australia Post in the absence of a universal service obligation for cash like has been imposed in the UK under the legislated right to cash. After the Optus, Medibank and Challenger Hanks and massive data exfiltrations, both banks and the government are bracing for the next wave of scams and identity fraud to hit at a weaponized scale after a key Russian ransomware operator was officially sanctioned under international law. The minister dutifully criticised the opposition, but in reality, there is almost no federal political opposition to the digital ID legislation now that increasing numbers of people and organisations are being extorted and looted, often before they realise it. And it will get worse before it gets better, with both Russia and China now invested in and salivating at the ability to structurally shift confidence, be they government or financial institutions. Governments in the West have shown that if they have information, they will use it against their own citizens. And Sky News host Cory Benani said the digital ID push by the Australian Labour government has the potential to become a licence to go on the internet. And we have been assured it's non-compulsory, but witness what happened in Canada last year when the government froze the bank accounts of those who dared to question Justin Trudeau's draconian COVID policies, including vaccine mandates. And of course, back in 2021, the Western Australian police outrageously accessed personal details collected by businesses for contact tracing. In other words, if governments have the data and the power, the likelihood is that they will abuse it. And then there is, of course, the wider story here, potentially linking digital ID with central bank digital currencies and social scores, perhaps enabling the idea peddled by the World Economic Forum and other non-elected global entities that we, the people, can be better controlled in terms of what we can do or say or even purchase. So if you value your privacy, liberty and the rule of law, the digital ID bill must be defeated. So time to put pressure back on the House of Representatives when the amended bill comes back then. But in perfect timing, if you want additional context, note that the Global Bank Messaging Network SWIFT announced the findings of the second phase of industry-wide sandbox testing on its central bank digital currency interlinking solution, with the results showing that its connector can enable financial institutions to carry out a wide range of financial transactions using central bank digital currencies and other forms of digital tokens easily incorporating them into their business practices. In one of the largest known collaborations on central bank digital currencies, 38 institutions, including central banks and commercial banks, as well as market infrastructures, took place in experiments which found that SWIFT's solution has the potential to simplify and speed up trade flows, unlock growth in tokenized securities markets, and enable efficient foreign exchange settlement, all while enabling financial institutions to continue to make use other existing infrastructure. And they went on to say that in the next couple of years, they expect to see the new platform connecting central bank digital currencies with existing financial systems. The move, which will be one of the most significant yet for the nascent central bank digital currency ecosystem, given SWIFT's key role in global banking, is likely to be fine-tuned to when the first major ones are launched. In fact, around 90% of the world's central banks are now exploring digital versions of their currencies. Most don't want to be left behind by Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, but are grappling with technological complexities. SWIFT's head of innovation, Nick Kerrigan, said its latest trial, which took six months and involved the 38-member group of central banks, commercial banks and settlement platforms, have been one of the largest global collaborations on central bank digital currencies and tokenized assets to date. It focused on ensuring different countries' central bank digital currencies can all be used together, even if built on different underlying technologies or protocols, therefore reducing payment system fragmentation risks, and also show that they could be used in highly complex trade or foreign exchange payments and potentially be automated so to both speed up and lower the cost of the processes. Kerrigan said the results, which 
had also proven banks could use their existing infrastructure had been widely regarded as a success by those who took part and given Swift a timeline to work to. We are looking at a roadmap to productize, launch a product, in the next 12 to 24 months, Kerrigan said in an interview, it's moving out of experimental stages towards something that can become a reality. Although the time frame could still shift if major economy central bank digital currencies get delayed, getting out of the blocks for when they do would be a major boost for maintaining SWIFT's incumbent dominance in the bank-to-bank -bank plumbing network. Countries such as the Bahamas, Nigeria and Jamaica already have central bank digital currencies up and running, and China as well advanced with real-life trials of the EEN. The European Central Bank has Digital Euro 1 underway, while the Bank for International Settlements, the Global Central Bank Umbrella Group, is running multiple cross-border trials. SWIFT's main advantage, though, is that it's got an existing network that's already usable in over 200 countries and connects more than 11,500 banks and funds use it to send trillions of dollars every day. And the firm has gone from being virtually unknown outside banking circles to a household name since 2022 when it cut most of Russia's banks off from its network as part of the West's sanctions for the invasion of Ukraine. And Kerrigan said that that kind of move could still happen in a new central bank digital currency system, but doubted whether it would stop countries from joining one. And the reason I've mentioned all of this is because the central bank digital currency part of the story, of course, is a big complex question, but it definitely can filter down into retail banking. And if retail banking and central bank digital currencies and those digital IDs all align, then effectively control is all but complete. This is why it's very, very important to understand how things are potentially playing out digitally speaking. And like I said at the top of the show, it's like the frog in the pot of boiling water as the temperature is slowly being turned up. So we need to be very careful and very cautious as this digital tyranny gets more and more in our face. The bottom line is this. It's already happening. And each time we don't resist, we get closer to an end state that, frankly, is more like 1984. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.